All right, good morning. Um, did folks get the handout for this week? It was in the back or no? Do we need to pass those out? Okay, Gary's handing some out. So if you need one, just raise your hand. Because we'll use it at the beginning here. All right, so as we've been talking about spreading the gospel, did anybody have any good opportunities you'd like to share with the group this week? Probably were opportunities, maybe you don't want to share. Okay. All right, well, keep that in mind, because I'm going to ask the question in the coming weeks. And this is one of the things I think that encourages us all, right? When you hear somebody else and hear how it went and maybe it wasn't as intimidating or, you know, that, that type of thing, then that's encouraging to the rest of us that might have that same thing that we need to overcome to share the gospel, right? All right, how about, uh, this is the accountability part that makes everybody uncomfortable, I guess, but how about uh, praying about what your role is and, and what have you. We've had those prayers in the bulletins and stuff. Folks, yeah? You, Jared, would you mind sharing? Did, has it changed your mindset or your focus as you start the day or anything as you've been doing that? Yeah, looking for opportunities, but we were challenged yesterday with a, we were in a coffee shop and there was someone talking about the propaganda that a local church had put up. And it was very dark and black propaganda, hell and damnation. And didn't know what to do in that situation because it's clearly not someone seeking the gospel. Yeah. And you know, do you stick your toe into a hornet's nest? You know, Jesus walked away from several of the conversations or it wasn't an opportunity and uh, wasn't bold enough. Yeah, so I don't know if everybody heard that, but Jared said they were in a coffee shop and they heard some folks talking about, you know, quote unquote propaganda from a local church about, you know, hell and damnation type stuff and that was very dark and sort of, okay, do you, is that an opportunity to stick your, your toe in the water? Is it more of a hornet's nest? And Okay, but that, that, that's, that's the stuff we face, right? It's always this question, is this the right time to share? And um, So we'll, we'll keep going through this study. So before we do that, we're going to go through the first page of the handout there, uh, just do a review of some things. And fill in the blanks as we go. Uh, so we'll see if uh, some folks want to guess at some of these things. Okay, so one of, one of the first things we covered right up front is the Great Commission is a command, right? Uh, we also talked about how it is sin not to share the gospel. We talked about how God can and will use me if I make myself available. We talked about the fact that joy should overwhelm trepidation. Those weren't the terms we used, but I tried to summarize that, that portion. So joy should overwhelm trepidation. That the happiest Christians are evangelistic. The next is that I am just the person God is looking for and has chosen to share Christ with others. That God does not call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Next one you don't have to fill out at all. It's just a reminder, get the idea of sharing being miser a miserable experience out of our heads. It's a blessing and it's the ultimate blessing. Uh, share starts with caring, concern, and burden. We need to have the minds of Christ. We need to pray both individually and together to advance the kingdom. And we share the gospel because we're told to. It brings joy to God and us. And it solves the problem of getting stale. Everybody got them? Do I need to repeat any? Everybody got all your blanks filled in? All right. So you can use that just as a reminder as we're going through, you know, even this next week, you could pull it out and um, sort of review some of those things. Uh, might 
spur you to pray a certain way or, or what have you. So the next two chapters that we're going to talk about uh, from the book Tell Someone by Greg Laurie, uh, chapter 4 uh, we'll start off with today, which is where to preach the gospel, um, and then we'll get into the next chapter after that. Um, so let's just go back to the Great Commission, Matthew 18, or 28, 18 to 20. Would somebody mind reading that again for us? Whoever gets to it first. Anybody get it? If it was in the army, I'd say sound off. (laughs) Somebody sound off, right? Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Yep, Jonathan, go ahead. Then Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Okay, so when we, when we hear that, right, that's a command, go into all your world, essentially, is, is what it's saying, right? It, different translations have it different ways. But let's personalize that a little bit. Let's talk about going into my world, as opposed to going into the world, right? So one is a little bit sort of, it's out there. And the other one is, it's right in front of me here today. Um, so every, every one of us has a sphere of influence as the, as the book lays out. There's people we work with, there's people we live by, engage daily relatives, etc. that we've talked about some of those. So here's the question. How do, you, how do you define your world? Like if you break it down. So on the back side of your hand out there, we're going to look at this a little bit differently. Uh, than what we've talked before, but take, start filling in this, this little sheet on the back, right? So and it, it might be easier to start from the bottom and work your way, sort of you know, start with that core, my day-to-day interaction, and then work it out to, all the way to your you know, greater than monthly interaction. And, and all you're doing is trying to fill out where you interact with unbelievers. Daily, weekly, whatever it is, okay? If you need to reference previous handout that you might have that on hand, just to remind you like who you're interacting with, that might be helpful, but to sort of brainstorm that a little bit. I think weekly is like an average for me. Okay. Weekly's neighbors? Yeah. Okay. We tend to bump into each other, walking down the road, or whatever that might be. Or okay. Kids out playing ball. Yep. Yeah, for the, for the you know, folks in the workplace, you know, obviously coworkers are probably more on the daily kind of daily realm. Family and friends. Family and friends. Might be daily, might be weekly, might be monthly, depending on how close you are to them. Um, but again, we're talking about where, not who. So think about where, right? So the neighborhood is one. The workplace is one. Might be the telephone or Zoom. Right? I, don't, I don't know, right? For family or friends. Could, could, yep. Yeah, grocery store, pharmacy, gas station. So write, write those kind of things down, right? So you're looking for where do you interact with unbelievers? The coffee shop, like Jared mentioned earlier. That's our link. <laughs> Jared needs a lot of caffeine. All right. Okay. So keep writing down your thoughts. And, and so, what do folks come up with? So, where do you interact with folks daily? We mentioned some things, but anybody have any other anything you want to throw out for daily interaction? Yeah. Please. The gym? Yeah, a lot of folks go to fitness centers or gyms. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, a lot of a lot of actual direct interaction with folks there too, if if you want it. <laughs> okay, how about how about weekly? Generally, church isn't the place, but sometimes it is. Yeah, go ahead. 
typically we shop at the same location. Yeah. Grocery yeah, so shopping, you know, it could be the grocery store, it could be some other places that we go to weekly, right? Most folks have some sort of weekly shopping trip that they're, they're doing things. Okay. Any other ideas? Wherever you volunteer. Okay, volunteer work. Yeah, some of you volunteer some time, and a lot of times that's a weekly kind of cycle that you do things. Um, maybe there's kids soccer games and those types of activities where you're interacting with other parents and or kids, right? Uh, so, got some of that, yeah. I was just sitting there thinking that uh, some of us guys get together on Tuesday morning for coffee and fellowship and we interact sometimes with other folks. Okay, so Gary is saying there's, there's group, there, you know, there's other groups in the church that might get together weekly to go out to breakfast or coffee or something and and even though that's not the group that you're intending to interact with, there's others that you get to interact with in that scenario as well. Okay, how about monthly? How about monthly? Nobody interacts with people on a monthly basis? Yeah, doesn't have to be exact. Months or so, like, like the doctor's office or the hair salon. Okay, might be a hairdresser or doctor's office or something, depending on what you've got going on in life. Okay, and then there's their greater than monthly things, right? Think about like holiday gatherings and things like that, right? Again, might be an office holiday gathering. It might be a different kind of community group kind of thing. It could be neighbors. A lot of neighbors have neighborhood kind of things on a regular basis. Roy? You know, we're talking about this, but the, but the honest truth is our culture is bending us to walking through a checkout line and saying thank you and that's it. We don't engage yeah. with people in general in conversation. Mm -hmm. And if we only do it to notch our, our gospel gun, that's inherently a problem. Yeah, so what Roy is saying, yeah, so Roy is saying, you know, part of the challenge is that the culture is sort of just, you sort of say thank you and move on, right? In checkout line, you don't tend to engage. And, self yeah, self checkout. Um, you know, there's all these, all these ways we can avoid contact with other people, and COVID sure didn't help that, right? Because even more ways were introduced. Um, and, uh, and, but, but I think it does bring up the point is we have to be very intentional, more intentional maybe than we used to have to be because of some of that scenario. So, okay, so we got some ideas. You, you can, again, you can think about that later and I would encourage you to because if you, if you think about where and you've already thought about who, when you go to that place then, and it's part of your deliberate thought process, then you are going to be looking for opportunities. Um, it's just sort of a natural thing, right? You're sort of saying, I'm going this place. I know there's going to be people. In fact, I know of two or three people. It doesn't necessarily mean you're forcing the conversation. It, the book would describe to that. It, it says you're looking for opportunities. You're praying about it before you go. We'll talk more about these things as we go through the book. But you're going to be more intentional about it, right? You're going to be saying, God, please help the Holy Spirit to make it clear when I'm supposed to speak or not to this person, right? And you're praying about those people that you know are going to be in that scenario. Jared, you had some? On a monthly sort of basis, I've different people that I've had interactions with, like coworkers in the yeah. past. I'll write it down and I'll try to call them back up every month or three months and just try to look back on that. Usually yeah. there's some kind of spiritual connection or conversation six months or a year ago. And just look for an opportunity because they know me. Try to, or past coworkers to try to, maybe that's one day that they're struggling with something and they actually ask, right. like, why is your life different? All right, so, you know, having, making a note of when you had a conversation and then circling back, which might be, as Jerry was saying, might be a month later, might be six months later. And you know what? Just sometimes bringing the conversation back up and asking them how they're doing on this or that or whatever the case is, that might be the day the Holy Spirit wanted you to ask that question. So... Again, it's about being aware of our surroundings and things as well, right? So, okay, so what the book says was, you know, you take that and then you, 
you personalize it even further, right? So now you've got that. Now take the Great Commission and say, go into all the blank, take any of the things you wrote on your paper there, and preach and teach the gospel. Right? So that could be go into all your neighborhood. Go into all your workplace and preach and teach the gospel. Right? And so when you sort of take that and personalize the command, it makes it a little more relevant in some ways uh, to, to how we're doing, is, is how the book would say that. So, um, so let, let's just uh, put it in perspective. For those of you in the workplace, and you, you could plug in anything different that's maybe not workplace, could be something else, right? But you know, how many waking hours do you spend with your coworkers? So let's just say eight hours a day in a normal workplace. You only get about six hours of sleep a night, we'll say, or whatever. So that gives you about 126 hours awake each week. So you spend about one-third of your waking life with people at work each week if you work just 40 hours a week, and some people work more than that. So the question that you would take from that is, are we investing in those people? I mean, that's a third of our waking hours, 40 hours a week, if we're in a day-to-day -day workplace or, you know, what have you. So aren't, aren't they worth investing in? Um, the book talks about how the workplace uh, is, it can be difficult, right? There's, there's rules against proselytizing maybe. Um, like when I was in the Army, there were strict rules about you can't proselytize, right? Um, but the book argues that it doesn't require street corner proclamations. It really only requires genuine care for others. So go back to chapter two. We talked about caring for others. Um, so th then it brings up some other questions, right? How do you do this when people are annoying? How do you care for those people? Sometimes it can be difficult, right? Um, maybe your enemies or adversaries, right? Uh, the, and the book will say, well, try to show them love. It's really hard to show love to somebody you dislike, or uh, it's hard to stay enemies with somebody that, um, that you're actually trying to care for. So then it goes in and says, well, you know, one of the questions is, are we running away from people or circumstances that we dislike? And the book brings out the example of Jonah, right? And most of us are familiar with that. So, you know, he's commissioned by God. He refused to go. You know, why? Well, it's probably a little hatred or at least dislike, at the very minimum, right? Um, probably had a certain uh, element of inconvenience. Good chance he was going to be rejected, or so he thought. Um, good chance of intimidation. And then he also had the fear of success, which is usually not the, the problem we have, right? Most of us don't have the fear of success, but... In the case of Jonah, you know, he had the fear of success and the fact that maybe he felt like he was also potentially betraying the trust of others, you know, by sharing the good news with the enemy, right? So, you know, as we go through that story, God made him pay attention, he repented, he was recommissioned, had great success, and as we all know, he was angry at God uh, because he saw people that he saw as undeserving of repentance and salvation actually turning to God. Which brings up an interesting point when we look at that story that the book draws out is, have we ever been angry at someone for showing compassion on or grace to somebody that we didn't think deserved it? I would venture to say most of us, yes, probably felt a certain amount of righteous indignation or something, right? Um, but, uh, you know, but that's where Jonah was. And then he, you know, was taught another lesson about God's grace and forgiveness. And in Jonah 4.2, it says, He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. You know, so again, getting into the mind of Christ, getting into how God wants us to think about others. You know, we can go right back to the story of Jonah uh, and take a look and, and think about that as well when we're looking at people. And where is our mindset when we're looking at others, be it caring 
or I don't like them because I know what they stand for, right? That would be more in Jonah's line of thinking, or they've done something to me, or that type of thing, right? So we, we all have different scenarios, but a lot of these can come back to understanding how God views uh, others. Okay, and then there's a, so, so we have that piece, but then you can look at, again, you are there for a purpose. God has placed us in circumstances at particular times with reason. Not just happenstance, with reason. And so the book goes in and talks about uh, Esther or Hadassah. Um, you know, in, in most of us, again, familiar with that story, right? So what's interesting is when you're reading through the story and you get past a little bit of that stuff with Mordecai, Mordecai and Haman and all that, you get to this part where Mordecai goes to Esther, and she seems pretty comfortable in the palace and to a bit, in, in a bit probably oblivious to what's going on because she's not necessarily exposed to that part of what's taking place in the court, right? But the Jewish nation is at risk of being wiped away, um, and Mordecai sends her a message in Esther 4.14, it says, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for all the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come out of a royal position for such a time as this. So in other words, if you keep quiet and God's ordained a purpose, he'll figure out how to deliver a person another way, right? But we need to be thinking about and praying about, am I in this position, am I in this scenario for a reason, right? Um, and ultimately, God saved the Jews through her. It doesn't mean that God's going to work through us in every circumstance, but he will use us. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, God has chosen us to be his vehicles. Uh, the next thing the book talks about is you are right where you are in life for just reaching that person on your mind. It doesn't say saving that person, that's the Holy Spirit's work, but for telling the good news. And so when we start taking things out of the perspective of coincidence and look at it through a lens of providence, it really does change how we approach it, I think. Don't you think? I mean, if one's just sort of happenstance, and oh, yeah, maybe there's an opportunity. Versus, you know, I'm going through my day, and God has providentially appointed that I'm going to interact with people, be it on my errands or workplace or whatever else. I think that should change our mindset a little bit. It does mine, at least. Um, where now I'm thinking, yeah, there's some purpose behind some of this, right? It's not just all happenstance, which is what our culture is sort of, driven us to think about, right? Scientific culture in America and all, a lot of it, this all happens by chance, right? And it's sort of driven into us and in a lot of things that we see and hear. But the reality is, as Christians, it's not by chance, right? It's, it's God's providence. So, the book outlines, if you don't do it, God can and will find somebody else to fulfill that, but that's not a reason to turn away, because then we have the shame of turning away, and God isn't trying to guilt us into doing things. Uh, the bill also then goes on to say, and in, in pose the question, are we happily ensconced in the security of church, as surrounded by our Christian friends, watching Christian movies, eating with Christian, at Christian restaurants, maybe, or reading Christian books, and there's nothing wrong with those things. Unless we find ourselves stuck in the little Christian bubble without contact with the real world of lost people. So, the question poses, the, uh, it brings up a, a question to ask yourself. Do you remind yourself that you are right where God wants you to be? And then says, do you think about why you are there right then? Now, it could have been some other reason why you went there originally. But, you know, the next line of, part of the line of thinking is, what could God be aligning 
for you to be part of. And look for divine appointments. So really what that drives us to is we're looking for the opportunity, we're paying attention, intentionally paying attention, and we're aware. And that's, that's the point of this part of the book, right? It's intentional, and we're not just sort of plodding through life and mindlessly going on from one thing to the next. The book then goes into, you know, is there a fear of rejection or failure? And do you find yourself saying, well, I gave it a shot, whatever that might look like. Um, is there a fear of success? So it might not look like Jonah, but maybe it's a little bit different fear of success, which is, what now? Or, huh, if this conversation's really take off, is that going to mess up the rest of my day? Um, or am I going to have more responsibility because I know there's going to be follow-on? And it's not necessarily an intentional thought, but in your mind you're going, oh, that's another thing I'm going to have to deal with, right? Um, so, you know, is, is that there? Um, or are you more like Jonah, you know, at times of running and avoiding? Or like Esther, you know, arguably she was content and comfortable until uh, things uh, were presented to her. So... I'll ask uh, the question to ask yourself, you sort of, it's, it's how do you rate yourself right now? Not the past or your aspirations, but uh, are you a stumbling block in doing nothing or doing nothing? Or worse yet, maybe you could argue, or you just sort of there and growing moss, <laughs> right? Uh, or are you a, a clean stepping stone that enables passage? And so the book asks, are you a bridge or a barrier? because you're either one or the other in most cases. Uh, so, we asked, so should we live the gospel or preach the gospel? And the answer is yes. That's the next part of the book. Um, and we're called to do both in the Great Commission. Uh, nothing hurts our presentation of the gospel more than contradicting what we say by the way we live. And I think we all, you know, we talk about this, we know about that. Um, but the book brings up there's two reasons why people say they don't go to the church, right? They know a Christian, and they don't know a Christian. But think about the first one. They know a Christian, right? So, um, you know, uh, hypocrisy, the book brings out, undermines our evangelistic efforts like nothing else. Um, you know, it, we probably have never heard anybody say they aren't a Christian because there's too many hypocrites in the church. Um, but the reality is that's an excuse, not a reason. Um, and the book also says, but they also, have, they also have a point, right? We have to live it to preach it. Billy Graham once said, we are the Bible that the world is reading, we are the creeds the world is needing, and we are the sermons the world is heeding. Now, there's men, many people that are searching and wanting, even hoping that you will slip up to justify their opinions. And the book goes on and says, look, you are going to make mistakes, but give evidence that there's something different about you, right? We shouldn't be saying, well, if that's the case, I just uh, shy away from interaction because I don't want them to see me slip up and I don't want to be the cause for their not becoming a believer. You're, the, look, genuineness is what's going to draw them probably closer. So the ability to slip up and then apologize or have humility and things will actually go much further in today's world than most of us give those things credence. The book also says we have to earn the right to be heard in their minds. So think about that. So you would think people would just say, you have the truth, I want to hear truth. But you've heard the saying probably at one point or another, perception is reality. Have you ever heard that? Well, in their minds, percep their perception is their reality. So... For most, you don't just deserve to be heard just because you have the truth. You actually have to earn the right to be heard. Uh, the book goes on to talk about how we're the salt of the earth, right? Matthew 5, 13 and 16 says you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. 
So we've all heard different analogies probably at one point or another in the church about, you know, salt and what have you, right? Uh, you could say, you, you look at salt in different aspects, right? Salt adds flavor. Those of you who cook know a little bit of salt goes a long way to adding a little bit of flavor, right? Think about that, about how it shows the joy of Christ, right? It adds the flavor to life. Um, you got salt preserves, right? We have to teach to preserve. Our presence alone can represent Christ and change the situation we're in. Uh, the book talks about, you know, you might hear things like off-color jokes at school or work, uh, those types of things. And to a degree, just making them uncomfortable enough to help them think about their state and sin will go a long way. When it's not acceptable for you to say those things in front of me, kind of thing, right? Then it makes them stop and think about right and wrong and those types of things, right? And the Holy Spirit often uses that because they feel convicted. And so Gary, Gary was in the Air Force. He probably saw this a lot in the Air Force. And I know I did in the Army, right? And when people would be talking about this or that, and, you know, you go up and you, you're entering into the conversation and you you know, you remind them that's not really appropriate to talk about and those types of things. You, can, I, you could physically see people change their disposition. It's not that uncommon, right? And, but if it's not addressed, then they think that's acceptable in your world as well. But the point is the Holy Spirit can often use that. Um, the, the book does bring out a caution, right? You don't have to get all preachy and condemning because they don't understand your point of view. And so ask, often that can become alienating. And so, you know, the little subtle comment is usually all it takes to get them thinking. Sometimes there's an opportunity, if it's just like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, where that could lead into a conversation. Why did you say that? Or why are you... Do you really think that, right? And that leads to a whole different kind of conversation. And it's, and it's not necessarily like in your face. It's just sort of like, I'm wondering why you, why would you say that, right, to somebody else or, or what have you, right? And that's sometimes all you have to do to, to start the conversation. Um, also, the book then goes into talking about expectations. How do we expect them to respond? Again, do we expect them to be true to form? Or do we expect them to all of a sudden come into our line of thinking, right? True to form is the Pratt state, right? And so we should have an expectation that that's, that's where they're coming from. Um, and then again, it goes on in the book again to talk about, are we there to build a bridge or, or what's our purpose? Um, then it also talks about how salt stimulates thirst. So think about popcorn and movies, right? They put extra salt on it, so they buy more soda. Well, it's not that much different in our witness, right? Put a little extra salt on there, so they want to hear more. It's, a, it's the same sort of thing, right? So one of the greatest compliments a non-believer uh, can probably say about a believer is that they saw something in that person, joy or something, that caused them to be curious. Because that means that you are being noticed. Um, so if you, if you haven't heard that comment or, or something, then you might want to think about how others are perceiving you, right? Go back to one of the things we, one of the questions we asked before. Uh, the book goes on to talk about the Paul and Silas in jail, right? This was part of the sermon just a couple weeks ago in Acts 16.25. And it uh, talks about, you know, at midnight Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them, right? They were paying attention. And they earned the right to be heard because of the suffering they went through and their ability to show the joy of Christ in spite of all that. So their actions paved the way for their message. Okay, so the book then goes on and, and sort of uh, talks about a different thing, right? How many of you like soda? Or maybe carbonated water? Okay, most of us. Um, how many of you like that same drink without the carbonation? I don't know. I mean, somebody might drink beer, somebody might drink soda, whatever the case is, right? So that's not quite the same, right? So the, the book 
uh, just throws out again, another little quip here. You know, don't be a Coke without carbonation, All right? Do something, live out our faith, have conversations with some energy, um, be carbonated. Hey, think about the extra carbonated thing, right? You shake up the Coke, right? Or you pour it into the cup with the ice and then you pour it in a little too much and right, foam falls over the rim. Now that's how we want to be sharing the gospel, right? So we want to be carbonated. Uh, for those of you who are coffee drinkers, if that doesn't resonate with you, you know, he has another statement that says, don't be decaf disciples, <laughs> right? So if you're a coffee drinker, you write that down, right? Be a caffeinated disciple. Um, so uh, the book goes on and then talks about the primary way God has chosen to reach people is through other people. Now, the primary way he works through other people is through the verbalization of the gospel, right? So Romans 10, 14 says... How then can they call on the one who they have not believed in? How can they believe? How can they, sorry, how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So the book tries to draw out an analogy, right? Think you're a scientist, you found the cure for cancer. Brilliant, right? So would it be wrong for you to withhold that from everyone because you're not comfortable talking to people? Well, most of us would say probably not. Or, and then the book would say, don't you have, wouldn't you have so much joy that you feel the need to share that with everybody you could? Right, because it would solve so much suffering. Gives another example of a newscaster just sitting at the table. TV's on, he's just sitting there, not saying anything. Right? And then you go up to the newscaster and say, hey, what did you do on the broadcast? Like, that was awful, right? And he's like, well, I just did the best I could. That's, that's what I felt like I could give today. And so again, some analogies to help us think about the fact that, yes, we have to verbally communicate. OK, chapter 5 is a short chapter. It talks about when we should share the gospel. And it dives back into this concept of it starts with having a purpose. We, last week we talked about having an objective, right? But it, has, it starts with having a purpose or a desire. So, you know, what would be great is if we wake up and it would be like Mission Impossible, right? Hey, Dave, your mission today, should you choose to accept it, is to go out and meet a man named Bob Smith who will be pumping gas at the QT on the corner at 11.02 a.m. But, you know, that's not how it really works, right? Um, what may occur is the low fuel light comes on, then go in to fill up, you strike up a conversation with a guy named Bob Smith at the pump that leads an opportunity to share. And then you realize there was an, a divine appointment in our ability to talk. Um, the book stresses it's good to go out with the express purpose of telling others of Christ, and we must always be available to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, a lot of us are familiar with the verse in 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So, you know, that old piece about going in and out of season, going out with an express purpose to share the gospel. Uh, there's a story in the book, which I'm not going to go through too much, so I'll give you the crib notes on it. Uh, Greg Laurie, the author of the book, goes into a bathroom at a mall, sits down, and, and you know, without going about that, he sits down in a stall, and a guy next to him in the next stall next, uh, next door says, hey, do you have something for me? And he's like, that's a really weird question to ask somebody in this stall. So he's like, what are you looking for? And he's like, well, I was you know, expecting somebody to come in with some drugs, right? So, he, so Greg Laurie cha you know, turns his conversation a little bit and says, well, I don't have drugs, but I have something far better for you. Um, and meanwhile, they're still in the stalls, right? They're still talking. And he's like, what? He's like, personal relationship with God. And he's like, I already tried that. Uh, he even tried going to such and such church, happened to be Greg Laurie's church, right? And, and rather than get, uh, you know, Frustrated by that, he says, you know, buddy, God must really have uh, love for you to interrupt your drug deal with the same pastor uh, 
you know, so that uh, you could hear this and deter you from that. So let's, let's talk outside, right? So they took it outside after a conversation, talking about what was going on in the guy's life and everything. He ended up rededicating his life to Christ. So the point is, you'll never know where the Lord will call you. If, if, if he's working through Greg Laurie in a bathroom stall, I'm sure we have much better circumstances we could probably work through. So, um, so the book asks, you know, what are some of your common open doors, right? Uh, you know, it could be that somebody asks you how your weekend was. That's, boy, that's a wide open door. You can say anything you want. You can say, yeah, it was great. You know, I went to church and there was this awesome sermon on blah, 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 right? to make it good at him. Um, but it could be, you know, I had this interaction with this other person and, you know, maybe start thinking about this and that, right? Just, I mean, just think about every week, somebody asks you probably multiple times throughout the week, how was your week going? Or how was your weekend, right? Um, so there's, there's, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to launch straight into the gospel necessarily. I mean, if you're talking with a neighbor, oh, great, I got some yard work done, but I was also able to do this and that, right? Um, and just the fact that we're here at church gives us something to talk about, right? I mean, you just invested so many hours of your weekend. No reason to avoid talking about that, right? It was important enough for you to be here. Um, so next week, we'll talk about how Christ went about this. And we'll use Christ's example uh, in the next couple of chapters in the book uh, to dig into that. Um, I'll just read the, the prayer that's, I think the prayer's in the book in here somewhere. Yep, it's on page, page two there. Um, so you can consider this for the prayer uh, for this week, which is, please give me the strength and courage to tell someone everywhere I go. Let my presence in the world enhance every place I inhabit. Lord, would you prepare me opportunities in my path to share the gospel on time? Would you conform my will and priorities to yours in someone else's time of need? Prepare the hearts would you prepare the hearts of those hearing me to be receptive to your good news? Make me ready, make me willing. In Jesus' name I pray. So you can consider that. Again, modify it if you need to, wherever your heart is. Um, but that will give you a, a basis uh, to do that. And then next week we'll dive back into the, the how-to, call it Jesus-style evangelism, I guess, for lack of better terms. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for... Uh, your congregation here. We thank you for this group that wants to know more about you, how to share the gospel with others so that others can have the same joy we have. And Lord, we ask that you would help convict us and then show us how we can use the different circumstances we're in. We would recognize your providence and that the Holy Spirit would uh, speak to us and that we would be open to that and take advantage of those opportunities, Lord. So many people around us in the different places we are and those we interact with need to hear you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us a boldness like we've never had before and that you would see your church prosper as a result. In Jesus' name, amen.